welcome to week four's uh, lectures on Austin's Northanger Abbey. In today's session, I'm going to talk about Gothic parody, the plot that Henry Tilney uh, comes up with for the benefit of Catherine Morland, and I'm going to conclude by talking uh, a little bit about female Gothic and uh, the despotism of General Tilney. One can call the narrative of Henry Tilney, the Gothic narrative of Henry Tilney, as artful parody. Uh, he parodies the Gothic plot when he is driving towards Northanger Abbey with um, Catherine Morland. And uh, the critic uh, McMaster argues that um, we can all agree that for the for, that for her first set of terrors, Henry himself is largely to blame. His artful parody of Gothic as he drives her towards the abbey supplies her with all the matter for her imaginings on that first stormy night. Since he delivers his beguiling narrative in the second person and the future tense, how fearfully will you examine the furniture of your apartment? It has the force of prophecy. So this is a very interesting comment that we can uh, you know, closely examine it uh, for the implications um, that they have for uh, the character of uh, Catherine as well as uh, for Henry Tilney. So Henry Tilney is an excellent reader of Gothic. Uh, we have uh, seen that much uh, in our previous lectures. So even though he is an excellent uh, reader and he parodies the Gothic, he makes fun of uh, Catherine Morland's um, impressionable nature, especially in um, reading the world through Gothic uh, lens, we also realize that Henry Tilney is culpable in uh, creating uh, Gothic terrors um, in the mind of Catherine uh, Morland. Um, when he drives towards the abbey with Catherine Morland, the narrative that he uh, comes up with is so beguiling, is so charming, is so fascinating for Catherine that um, she begins to kind of, um, you know, uh, be taken up so much by that kind of story uh, that when she actually enters that um, house uh, she begins to read everything around her um, as if she is uh, reading a gothic uh, novel so the, there are two very uh, important aspects to this uh, bit of criticism by mcmaster which is firstly she points out um, that um, that Henry Tilney is addressing um, Catherine Morland directly. You can see the use of the second person. How fearfully will you examine? So he is um, imaginatively placing Catherine Morland in that uh, uh, house, in that abbey, and he is somehow, uh, in a weird way, um, capturing the future in the present uh, so that uh, Catherine Morland becomes a Gothic heroine of sorts. Um, secondly, she says that this kind of um, foreseeing um, of, the, of the future is, is prophetic because Catherine uh, Morland puts it into practice when she uh, stays in Northanger Abbey. So you can see how um, implicated Henry Tilney is in the way Catherine Morland behaves in uh, Northanger Abbey. And we also remember that uh, Henry Tilney is an avid reader of the Gothic too. Um, he, read, he has read a lot of Gothic fiction, but he is a good reader, quote unquote, because he knows the difference between uh, reality and fiction. And uh, even though he knows all the Gothic tropes, um, uh, Gothic tropes and, uh, and all the attributes of Gothic, um, he is able to be um, uh, able to differentiate between uh, the two, the, the, the tropes that uh, one finds in a Gothic novel and the furniture of uh, reality, of, of domesticity. Now, we have referenced Henry Tilney's Gothic narrative so many times uh, in our uh, lecture discussions. Uh, it will be better uh, to read uh, from the novel uh, this Gothic narrative conjured by Henry Tilney. Um, so I'm reading from the novel. So this is a quotation from the 
novel and this is what he tells Catherine Moreland um, that might happen to her. No, certainly we shall not have to explore our way into a hall dimly lighted by the expiring embers of a wood fire, nor be obliged to spread our beds on the floor of a room without windows, doors or furniture. But you must be aware that when a young lady is, by whatever means, introduced into a dwelling of this kind, she is always lodged apart from the rest of the family. Look at the way he concludes here in this extract on the slide that um, perhaps Catherine Moreland is going to be put in a uh, part of the house which is um, you know, isolated from the rest of the family. And, and this kind of comment uh, makes Catherine wonder as to the reasons um, as to why this particular guest is uh, is lodged in a different part of the uh, household um, and, and away from the rest of the uh, family. While they snugly repaired to their own end of the house, Henry Tilney continues the story. She is uh, formally conducted by Dorothy, the ancient housekeeper, up a different staircase and along many gloomy passages into an apartment never used since some cousin or kin died in it about 20 years before. Can you stand such a ceremony as this? asks Henry Tilney to Catherine Merlin. So uh, you can see how he's gently poking fun at the kind of events um, that Catherine Moreland perhaps anticipates uh, when she is going to uh, stay at Northanger Abbey. So he says that, you know, while the rest of the family are going to go to their um, snaf uh, snug, comfortable, um, you know, uh, spaces, living spaces, uh, she will be, uh, Catherine Moreland will be formally taken away by that ancient, uh, housekeeper um, and she will uh, be taken up a different staircase uh, past many gloomy dark passages into an apartment that had never been used since somebody died in it um, a couple of years ago ages ago so you can um, immediately see all the cues and paraphernalia of uh, the gothic uh, narrative such as the ancient housekeeper just as the house is very ancient, the housekeeper is also ancient and we also are reminded of the gothic trope of how the structure of um, the gothic house is something which is a vestige from the past. So just as the gothic castle, the Northanger Abbey um, and other, uh, you know, uh, key uh, domestic setups, um, you know, domestic structures of gothic novels are, um, you know, uh, elements from the past. So is this present one to which a Catherine Morland is going to be a guest. So the element of the ancient is a gothic characteristic, gloomy passages, of course, and um, the idea that, you know, the guest would be um, placed in an old, unused um, uh, bedroom of sorts is um, part and parcel of the gothic paraphernalia. So he is trying to scare um, Catherine Morland as well as get her excited about um, her fascination with ancient structures um, such as uh, you know, such as God, uh, Northanger Abbey. He continues the gothic narrative. Will you not mind misgive you when you find yourself in this gloomy chamber? too lofty and extensive for you with only the feeble rays of a single lamp to take in its size its walls hung with tapestry exhibiting figures as large as life and the bed of dark green stuff or purple velvet presenting even a funereal appearance will you not uh, will your heart not sink within you so he continues with the gothic uh, description of the interiors of her chamber, of her bedroom in that um, abbey. And he says that it's going to be very gloomy. It's large as well. It's lofty. Um, it's, it's vast. Uh, it, it's too vast perhaps for Catherine, for this young, small uh, female. And there will only be a single uh, source of light which is this lamp and and that lamp is of course not sufficient to lighten up the entire 
chamber and he further goes on to say that there will be uh, you know tapestry hangings uh, cloth hangings and uh, on those uh, uh, material there will be uh, figures um, you know uh, figures depicted on it which which are larger uh, which are as large as life and um, the bed is dark in color dark green or pearl purple and all these uh, color have a symbolic association uh, with the funeral with death and so uh, this kind of ambience will uh, Henry Tilly suggests that might make Catherine Moreland's heart sink within her. So you can see how very full on um, his gothic description uh, of Northanger Abbey is for the benefit of Catherine Moreland. He is playing with her, he's toying with her, he's being sarcastic, he's being playful, and yet. Um, there is a, a, a subtle element of thre threat um, that uh, is coded in Northanger Abbey. It's a symbolic threat, but the threat is there. How fearfully will you examine the furniture of your apartment and what will you discern? Not tables, toilets, wardrobes or drawers, but on one side perhaps the remains of a broken lute, on the other a ponderous chest which no efforts can open, and over the fireplace the portrait of some handsome warrior whose features will so incomprehensibly strike you that you will not be able to withdraw your eyes from it. So he continues, Henry Chilney continues with the gothic description of that apartment and he says that nothing will be of the usual or the routine or the everyday but um, there will be a uh, broken objects, um, objects which are inaccessible to her. In terms of a broken object, there is a broken lute symbolizing some kind of broken uh, romantic uh, narrative. And uh, there's a chest suggesting mystery. Uh, it's so heavy that, you know, one cannot open it. And there will be a painting, of course. All Gothic novels have paintings, you know, and, and um, that painting will depict a handsome war a warrior uh, who will be so striking that Catherine will not be able to take her eyes off it. So you can see that while he's describing, he is uh, drawing the attention of Catherine to his narr narrator. In fact, you can say that he is enjoying uh, the attention that he receives from Catherine. You can see or imagine the rapt attention of Catherine Moreland. You can see her expression uh, increase in uh, uh, intensity as she is listening to Henry Tilney. So, this kind of um, attention is uh, enjoyed by Henry Tilney and uh, while while he is telling her an exciting tale he is also frightening her so um, a, this combination is what makes the gothic work the combination of um, fear and excitement and, and curiosity uh, is such a heady uh, mixture that Catherine is hooked Henry Tilney continues with his gothic narrative. He states that uh, Dorothy, meanwhile, no less struck by your appearance, gazes on you in great agitation and drops a few unintelligible hints. To raise your spirits, moreover, she gives you reason to suppose that the part of the abbey you inhabit is undoubtedly haunted and informs you that you will not have a single domestic domestic with a call with this parting cordial she courtesies off you listen to the sound of her receding footsteps as long as the last echo can reach you and when with fainting spirits you attempt to fasten your door you discover with increased alarm that it has no lock you can see how he is increasing the horrors that might uh, visit Catherine Moreland um, while she is staying within the abbey. He states that um, Dorothy, the ancient housekeeper, will be uh, hinting something unintelligible to Catherine Morland and those hints um, are um, going to increase uh, Catherine's um, susceptibility um, to potential um, gothic threats. In this passage, you can see how uh, Henry Tilney uh, touches on both the suggestive aspects of the Gothic um, and, um, you know, the, the kind of um, 
real terrors as well. The suggestive uh, relates to comments about unintelligible, um, you know, ideas uh, regarding um, threats that could um, affect Catherine and the reference to hauntings, the, you know, the potential for spirits um, to uh, visit that part of the household and the real terrors um, involve the uh, uh, the point there uh, that is uh, mentioned by Tilney that uh, when uh, Catherine tries to lock the door, this imaginary Catherine uh, in the future, when she tries to lock the door, she will discover that it has no lock. So this is a very interesting um, passage in that uh, regard. You can see how he also uses the character of Dorothy to uh, scare Catherine, this Catherine uh, who would foresee or who would um, enjoy all these um, uh, happenings um, to her when she is uh, staying in uh, Northanger Abbey. So this uh, housekeeper um, is the one who also uh, apparently mentioned, would mention to Catherine that, you know, um, there will be no domestic uh, within call in case uh, she needs any help in the middle of the night. So all these uh, gothic tropes, you know, the, the trope of uh, spirits, the trope of the scary housekeeper who's um, very old, um, the idea that, you know, there's no lock to her door which might protect her. A locked door always protects the, uh, you know, um, the resident uh, in that bedroom. But uh, you can also see that that is not going to be available to uh, Catherine uh, Moreland. So this narrative that I have uh, read uh, across uh, these slides tells you the powerful nature of Henry Tilney's tale. Uh, he is not just a storyteller; he is kind of kind of a prophet, um, an oracle, one who foresees uh, things that might happen to Catherine um, in Northanger Abbey. So the Catherine, who was traveling with Henry Tilney, uh, is, is kind of um, foreseeing um, the Catherine who is going to enjoy, suffer through all these gothic terrors. Um, and, and that kind of um, foresight is given to her now by uh, her companion, Henry Tilney. So you can see a very kind of postmodern um, uh, framework that is being um, set up in this moment in the novel when the present Catherine um, kind of uh, has a glimpse into the future uh, of her life when she undergoes all these gothic terrors and when when the you know housekeeper terrifies her when she realizes that there is no and there's no lock to her room so all these um, are, are uh, incidents uh, which are part of that tale that cat that um, Henry tells Catherine so Henry being her oracle Catherine is almost bound to do as he predicts so he since he is a prophet like figure um, Catherine has no choice but to kind of enact that prophecy it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in some respects um, so he predicts something and Catherine makes sure that she does something um, more or less similar to what he has um, predicted. And he knows fully well how suggestible she is. Henry knows that she is very impressionable, that she is consuming a lot of gothic fiction. And she has um, a particular idea about uh, Northanger Abbey, which is along the lines of the gothic. So when he concludes, when he, uh, referring to uh, Henry, when Henry uh, concludes his tale, uh, your lamp suddenly expires in the socket and leaves you in total darkness, she exclaims, Catherine exclaims, oh, no, no, do not say so. But he does nothing to disarm his dangerous prediction or bring her back to reality. So you can see when he is telling the tale, Catherine is responding as that Catherine in the future in Northanger Abbey, lost in that gothic darkness, would respond. So when, when she says, oh no, do not say so, um, as a response to his comment that, you know, the lamp will go out, um, she is reacting as how that Catherine lost in the darkness would react. So she has inhabited that story. She's gone into that future narrative. Um, so you can see how very suggestible, innocent, naive uh, that Catherine Merland is. But 
you can also see uh, that Henry Tilney does not do anything very um, significant to um, collapse that tale to kind of uh, deconstruct that tale to tell her uh, that okay this is just a figment of his imagination that he has conjured up to scare her to excite her uh, and and he doesn't really kind of bring back to the actual world he doesn't tell her very effectively the difference between uh, reality and fiction now uh, Catherine has her own um, assumptions about uh, the nature of the relationship between General Tilney and his wife who is dead. Um, so of her unhappiness in marriage, she felt persuaded in her refers to Mrs. Tilney. The general suddenly had been an unkind husband. He did not love her well. Could he therefore have loved her? And besides, handsome as he was, there was something in the tone of his features which spoke his not having behaved well to her. So you can see the surmises, um, the assumptions um, that uh, Catherine Moreland makes about the nature of General Tilney's marriage. Um, she quickly uh, comes to certain conclusions. The general did not uh, like the works of his wife, therefore he uh, did not love her. And uh, even though he was handsome, you know there is a peculiar uh, turn of his features. There is a certain uh, element in his um, uh, facial expressions, of his features that uh, perhaps suggest uh, that he did not uh, treat his wife well. So. These are some of the conclusions to which Catherine comes to and this is a gothic fantasy that she believes in um, uh, really so that you know it, this kind of belief also helps her to navigate um, the um, speciality of Northanger Abbey. Reading a physiognomy is a recurring activity in the mysteries of Adolfo and Catherine aspires to be an uh, to be as expert in the art as Emily said or Bert. Soon as the general silently stalks the drawing room with downcast eyes and contracted bro, uh, brow, Catherine concludes um, that, uh, you know, uh, Catherine concludes that he has the air and attitude of a Montoni. So it should be Catherine concludes, the S should come um, with conclude and therefore it should read Catherine concludes he has the air and attitude of a Montoni, the abuser, incarcerator and probably the murderer of his wife. Uh, her gothic plot making once begun the horrors multiply. So reading somebody's face is also a gothic uh, trope and this happens in the mysteries of Adolfo when Emily St. Aubert uh, reads the facial expressions of Montoni. So um, in that uh, kind of um, uh, tradition, Catherine Morland reads uh, the uh, physiognomy of General Tilney and she watches him silently stalk the room, walk the, up and down the drawing room um, and, and he is downcast. He looks upset and he is uh, thinking about something intensely with contracted brow and Catherine immediately concludes that, you know, he looks like uh, he has the behavior, he has the attitude, an air of a Montoni, Count Montoni from the Mysteries of Adolfo who is an evil villain who locks up Emily and her aunt. Um, so you can see how very quickly, uh, you know, uh, uh, Catherine Moreland connects uh, the appearance of uh, General Tilney with the appearance of Count Montoni. Um, at this point, uh, General Tilney has not done anything to uh, suggest uh, to Catherine that he is really evil. He hasn't locked her up. He hasn't kicked her out of the house yet. But you can see um, that Catherine Moreland is quickly uh, making a, a lot of judgments about uh, General Tilney and um, she draws uh, parallels between Montoni who is an abuser, incarcerator and um, so you get you can see um, you know General Tilney becomes Count Montoni and her gothic plot making uh, once begun by Catherine um, the horrors that, uh, that she imagines multiply hugely. Having moved from gothic decor to gothic 
thought Catherine is the more likely to get into trouble, and she does. This time, Henry catches her in the act of snooping near his dead mother's room, and Catherine is overwhelmed with guilt. You can see how um, this over-imaginative uh, heroine Catherine Moreland uh, acts on the various narratives that she has read and heard, including the one told to her by Henry Tilney, and she tries to uh, put into practice whatever she has read and heard, and she uh, snoops um, near Mrs. Tilney's uh, room, the dead mother of Henry Tilney's uh, room, and um, she is caught in her act of snooping, and uh, when Henry Tilney uh, takes her to task, she is overwhelmed, um, she is, um, you know, suddenly aware of the excesses of her gothic imagination and she feels terribly guilty uh, about suspecting uh, General Tilney's hand in the death of um, Mrs. Tilney. Henry is onto her suspicions in a flash, so fast in fact that he creates some suspicions himself. Um, you had formed a sur surmise of such horror, um, he reproaches her, as I have hardly words to, and indeed words fail him. But just how much evidence is there for Henry to deduce her horrid surmise? True, she is guilty about her unwarranted explorations to his mother's room. Uh, you can see how McMaster not only questions um, Catherine's actions here, uh, she also questions um, the behavior of Henry Tilney. How could Henry become so uh, suspicious so quickly? Um, so if he is um, kind of coming to the point so directly, um, what makes him um, come to such a conclusion about Catherine Moreland's assumption? So is he also thinking along the lines of Catherine Moreland about the death of his mother? So these are the questions that immediately come to um, critics such as uh, McMaster. We realize that Henry becomes uh, intensely upset over Catherine's imaginings because, as he implicitly concedes, they bruise his soul feelings and memories. His mother had had to bear much from her husband's temper and coldness. The motives for the marriage had been pragmatic and mercenary for the husband, and as a result for the wife, um, insofar as her life for the husband was concerned, unhappy. So we deduce a lot of... Um, things from Henry's confessions, um, quote-unquote, because he does um, inform uh, Catherine Moreland that, you know, uh, the narrative of his mother, that the story of his mother is um, associated with painful memories, sore feelings. Um, so, he also uh, concedes, uh, confesses, accepts that you know the marriage of her fa of his father and mother were uh, were were made for pragmatic, practical reasons, for uh, mercenary reasons. Um, you know, uh, it was not a romantic marriage, and as a result, uh, the wife was unhappy. Henry's mother was unhappy. So, uh, because of these uh, memories. Um, Henry is upset to realize that Catherine Moreland is um, kind of further uh, questioning um, the nature of the relationship between um, General Tilney and, um, and uh, Mrs. Tilney. So all these associated ideas uh, makes him unhappy that he's not even able to kind of uh, fully, um, you know, uh, put it in uh, words, the assumptions of Catherine Moreland. And Catherine's uh, horrid surmise is uh, put in these uh, words. She becomes uh, suspicious because of certain circumstances. She states, your mother's dying so suddenly and you, none of you being at home and your father, I thought perhaps had not been very fond of her. That's all she says and it's not much to go on, is it? And, he yet, and yet he guesses, you infer perhaps the probability of some negligence, some uh, involuntarily she shook her head, or it may be something less, still less pardonable. So 
you can see uh you know uh, how Catherine arrives at her horrid surmise the horrid uh, assumption that general tilney perhaps killed his wife uh, which is that you know none of the children were at home when um her mother died and um and and your father she says to henry was apparently not very fond of her and and not uh, being fond doesn't mean that he had in fact murdered her and um so henry is really offended by the kind of quick assumptions um, that uh, catherine morland comes to so uh, but you can see how um Catherine Morland picks up on certain suggestive elements surrounding the death of Mrs. Tilney and those suggestive elements are uh, some of the tropes of Gothic narrative. The question is, if he can so swiftly guess her surmise, he referring uh, to Henry Tilney, if Henry can so swiftly guess Catherine's uh, surmise and on such slender evidence, doesn't it suggest he knows that the general was brutal to his wife that he did drive her to an early grave uh, even if he didn't actually murder her at the end of the novel sure enough after the general's outrageous behavior to catherine herself we are told catherine heard enough to feel that in suspecting general tilney of either murdering or shutting up his wife she has scarcely sinned against his character or magnified his cruelty so uh, there is a suggestion which is very clear that, uh, and what what is that suggestion even though henry uh, his father general tilney did not actually murder his wife he could have um you know put, driven her to an early grave he could have killed her out of um his um indifference coldness and um all these um all these um comprehension uh, that Catherine uh, Moreland uh, eventually, uh, you know, derives about the general makes her feel that she um, had sinned um, against, um, not she had actually not sinned against his character, or uh, she might just have magnified his uh, cruelty. So Catherine feels that she uh, was right in um, guessing that the general had been cold and not very fond of uh, his wife so it might not be a literal murder but it is um, a, a, a death brought about by um, the general's um, uh, indifference and the treatment uh, the cold treatment of his wife now let's um, come back to the idea of the female gothic in essence female gothic novels expose societal gender inequalities in fact that's the most important point about uh, female gothic and how very um powerfully it lays bare the gender discrimination the double standards and the inequality between the sexes and Northanger Abbey evokes and plays with Gothic tropes and conventions, and it also makes an uh, 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 it also makes references to other Gothic novels. So by playing with Gothic tropes and conventions, it becomes part of the uh, Gothic, even though there is a parody of it. Uh, uh, in fact, using that parody, um, Northanger Abbey is very successful in uh, laying bare the gender inequality and the uh, oppression suffered by the uh, female sex. Miriam Raingold Fuller asserts that Northanger Abbey represents a particular brand of the female Gothic, the domestic Gothic, the purpose of which is to underscore the realistic but seemingly innocuous dangers and misfortunes that beset Catherine and Eleanor, whether they be social, financial, or sexual. So what um, uh, Fuller here tries to do is give uh, another uh, subcategory to the female uh, gothic which is um, that of the domestic gothic and the domestic gothic uh, um, points uh, very powerfully to um, the misfortunes uh, and the dangers uh, and on the oppressions and sufferings undergone by uh, women with regard to social financial and sexual uh, domains so Catherine Catherine and Eleanor are caught in that um, set of um, discriminations um, 
you know you you, you know that Catherine uh, cannot marry uh, Henry uh, very easily because she's not rich enough and Eleanor and her um, you know lover cannot um, join in a holy matrimony that very easily because of objections to their marriage so uh, the domestic gothic and the female gothic come together here to make a very powerful comment about the nature and rule of women in society so they, they do not have financial independence they are socially underprivileged um, be, uh, you know if they don't have the right uh, connections the right uh, amount of wealth and um, they, they need to be uh, you know uh, endowed in, in various aspects to be attractive to the uh, male uh, partner now let's talk uh, very briefly about gentle Tilney. He is a despot uh, accustomed on every ordinary occasion to give uh, the law in his family. His binding authority is such that he uh, he is always checking uh, his children's spirits. Um, gentle Tilney is a person who wants absolute control and authority over his uh, family. In fact, um, you know, his children's spirits are also controlled uh, by, um, by gentle Tilney name he is the lawgiver and and uh, he he wants his um, uh, household to be under his thumb entirely yet Jane Austen's representation of his despotism is uh, subtle as well uh, Alistair Duckworth observes that his domestic tyranny is revealed in his exacting demand of punctuality from his family he betrays an extraordinary degree of impatience and irritation with any delay and certainly his obsessive attitude towards time. So his obsession with time is also an indication of his exacting behavior or his domestic tyranny. Um, the demand for punctuality is uh, actually an assertion of his authority and when somebody uh, disobeys him in this regard, he becomes extremely impatient and uh, irritated. So we realize that General Tilney is very similar to Montani because of his thirst for money and his severe attitude, but he does not kill anyone directly. Uh, it, it's a kind of a symbolic murder of happiness um, that he does. Um, you know, if at all he can be called uh, as a murderer, it's, it's, a, it's a symbolic uh, murder and not a literal one. He's a burlesque uh, version of Montani, and this is characterized by his manifestation of violence in trivial events. Uh, Montoni gets angry and has a tyrannical attitude, whereas General Tilney is violent for the sake of being violent. Um, for instance, General Tilney was pacing the drawing room, his watch in his hand, and having on the very instant of their entering pull the bell with violence, order dinner to be on the table directly. So you can see how very uh, patriarchal um, that General Tilney is, and that kind of power. Um, on his part, the, the demand for obedience uh, from his uh, inferiors and from his family members uh, reflects on the um, uh, imposing nature, oppressively imposing nature of General Tilney. In other words, he is like a villain who has lost his authority and who feels the need to remind us constantly that he is the master. So those subtexts are also prevalent to the character of General Tilney. He, he thinks... Uh, and he believes that power is slipping away from his hands and he has to kind of establish that in a very loud uh, manner, in a very uh, aggressive and violent manner. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.